We will now discuss some concepts related to water and electrolyte balance in animals, and we'll focus really on our kidneys and the role that they play during osmoregulation as they're involved in the formation of urine within our bodies. So let's begin with just uh, briefly mentioning some of the solutes and components that we're talking about within our bodies. So for example, we can talk about electrolytes. These are various ions such as sodium, potassium, and chloride ions that of course need to be regulated within our bodies. Also various nutrients glucose, vitamins, and so forth. pH, the concentration of protons within our blood, that also needs to be regulated within our bodies, and also various waste products. What we're going to do in this chapter is focus on nitrogenous waste products. So we can consume proteins, and, and most other animals consume proteins as well. And as a result of digestion, we form these, these various types of nitrogenous waste products within our bodies. So different animals can form and get and essentially get rid of different types of nitrogenous wastes. So animals produce ammonia uh, initially as a result of digesting proteins. Now some organisms, many aquatic organisms for example, uh, the ammonia itself can, uh, since it's very soluble in water, it can be released directly from the organism itself and that can be an effective way to get rid of that waste product. Other organisms, such as ourselves, we convert ammonia to urea. So urea is still fairly soluble in water, not quite as toxic as ammonia. So we can produce urea within our urine, store it in our bladders. Other animals, for example, insects and even birds, they convert ammonia to a, a highly concentrated form that also is not very soluble in water, namely uric acid. So if you think of a bird dropping, for example, uh, if you look closely, you might notice there's often a dark component and also a light or white colored component. It's that white component of bird droppings that essentially is uric acid. So again, uric acid, highly concentrated form of nitrogen, not very soluble in water. So it's an effective way for, for animals such as birds and insects to get rid of their, uh, their nitrogenous waste products. Let's spend a bit of time talking about kidneys. Kidne kidneys, are, of course, are the excretory organs we find in vertebrates, including ourselves. And of course, the main job that these do is essentially filter our blood, regulate all the solutes we mentioned previously, and of course, produce urine. Now, kidneys are fairly complex organs. We're not going to talk about all the details, but just a few major components I want to mention regarding kidneys. Uh, here we see an image with a few, a couple of kidneys and, and, and a person here. Notice there's a large blood vessel entering each kidney, the renal artery. Also a large blood vessel exiting each kidney, namely the renal vein. There's also a ureter, which of course carries urine that's formed in the kidneys down to the bladder where it is stored. Also notice toward the right, if you slice a kidney in half, I just want to point out we can uh, distinguish these two general regions, namely this outer cortex region and this more inner medulla region. So try and keep this, this orientation of this outer cortex and this inner medulla in mind as we discuss how the kidneys actually function. The functional unit of kidneys are these structures referred to as nephrons. So here we see an image uh, illustrating, looks like one, two nephrons here in this image. And let's just briefly point out the, the different regions and different portions of a nephron, because as we'll see, they play different roles during the formation of urine. So the first structure I'll mention is the renal corpuscle. Here we see toward the left, a single renal corpuscle. Uh, what we actually see is this outer uh, portion of the renal corpuscle. This is referred to as the, the Bowman's capsule. If you look at this renal corpuscle toward the right, notice there's a, a blood vessel that enters that renal corpuscle and of course a blood vessel that exits. So there's actually a small ball of capillaries referred to as a glomerulus within the renal corpuscle. And this is actually where blood filtration takes place. And we'll come back to that in just a moment. So here's beginning with a, a renal corpuscle. If we follow the path of a nephron, we come across this, this twisted, convoluted region. We call this the proximal tubule, or simply the PT. If we keep traveling the path of our nephron, next we see this long structure right here, which dips down into the medulla. That's the loop of Henle, named after the person who identified this structure. And I also want to point out that we can identify the, the so-called descending and ascending limbs. So here's our descending limb. 
dipping down into the medulla, the ascending limb going back up toward the cortex. Next, if we keep going, we have another convoluted or twisted region. This is our distal tubule. And then finally, notice that this nephron connects to this large structure right here. This is the collecting duct, which essentially collects all of the urine produced in all of the thousands and thousands of nephrons within our kidneys and carries it out of the kidney on its way to our bladder. So think about the production of urine in our kidneys. It turns out that when blood is filtered and used to produce urine, the urine that's produced can actually be a lot more concentrated than the blood itself. So again, typically urine is more concentrated than blood. And in humans, our, our urine can be roughly oh, four times as concentrated as the blood itself that's filtered. And some animals, like this kangaroo rat right here that live in dry, hot, desert-like conditions, they can actually produce urine that's at least 10 times as concentrated as their blood. So this is a, a very uh, distinct way. There must be distinct mechanisms in place in order to conserve water to, to enable us to produce urine that's more concentrated than the blood that is initially filtered. So let's now take a look and see how urine is produced and how we can actually produce such concentrated urine. So I'll identify four general steps involved in the production of urine. Beginning with filtration. So what we see here is a slice through a renal corpuscle. So here's our outer Bowman's capsule. Here's that ball of capillaries, the glomerulus inside. So essentially what's taking place during filtration is blood pressure simply forces the liquid portion of blood out of these glomerular capillaries. The large components, namely the blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, and so forth, they of course remain in the capillaries, but a lot of liquid portion of blood is forced out of those capillaries. This process is non-selective. So in other words, everything in the liquid portion is filtered out. Even all the stuff that we want to retain within our bodies, such as glucose, hormones, vitamins, and so forth. Okay. And again, the driving force behind filtration is simply blood pressure. Overall, if we, obviously it varies, but if we, if we keep track of how much blood is filtered and lost from these glomerular capillaries, we might lose about 180 liters of blood through the process of filtration each day. Obviously, most of that is recaptured uh, and retained within our bodies, but that's essentially a volume of blood that's filtered out of these glomerular capillary, capillaries on a daily basis. So obviously we, we, we can't lose that much uh, fluid on a daily basis, so we must have to be able to somehow recapture much of that fluid and a lot of the components that we want to retain within our bodies. So the next, next major step I'll identify is reabsorption. So this is where most of the water, glucose, vitamins, and so forth are reabsorbed from the filtrate, right? That's the liquid portion that's captured in the, in the renal corpuscle here, reabsorbed from this filtrate back into the vasa recta. Let me point out that the vasa recta is this extensive system of blood vessels that totally surround and interact with the nephrons themselves. So essentially removing components from the nephron back into our bloodstream so they are retained within our bodies. This process of reabsorption can occur both in the proximal and the distal tubule, but let's just say, for the most part, it tends to occur uh, to occur mainly in the proximal tubule. In a general sense, how does reabsorption work? Well, it, it involves some active transport and also co-transporters. And so co-transportation, that's the simple idea that when you have one solute moving through a protein, across the membrane. When that solute moves across that, that membrane, that pulls a different solute along with it. So the basic model behind how we think reabsorption occurs essentially goes something like this. We're looking at an image here. Uh, we're looking at a section, if we look to the left initially, a section through uh, the, the proximal tubule. The lumen is just this middle region here, surrounded by the epithelial cells of the tubule. And so the sketch on the right, what we have toward the top, this is the lumen, so this is where the filtrate is located. Here is an epithelial cell of the proximal tubule, and then this blood vessel down the bottom, this would be part of the vasorectus. So the idea is, how do we move specific things from this filtrate 
initially produced in the renal corpuscle, how do you move it from the filtrate back into our bloodstream so that these various components are retained within our bodies? And the, the model goes something like this. Notice we have this, this active transport protein located down the bottom here. It's actively transporting sodium out of the epithelial cell. So the sodium then is picked up in, <clears throat> in the blood vessel toward the bottom here, namely the vasorecta. If the sodium is pumped out of this epithelial cell, that's going to establish a concentration gradient. So there'll be more sodium in the filtrate than there is inside the epithelial cell. If that concentration gradient is established, that will then allow sodium to diffuse from the filtrate into the epithelial cell. And so we see that taking place toward the left here, toward the middle, and toward the right. And notice that the green proteins through which sodium diffuses into the epithelial cell, they also can carry other molecules as well. So when sodium makes its way through this co-transport protein, it also carries glucose with it. When sodium makes its way through this co-transport protein, it carries chloride ions with it. Through this one, it carries various items, uh, various vitamins. So now we're establishing high concentration of all these components inside the epithelial cells. They then diffuse out of the epithelial cells and again are picked up by the vasorecta and of course retained within our bodies. So in a general sense, and, and well, if you think about it too, water then will also follow simply by osmosis, right? All these solutes building up in high concentrations toward the bottom, water follows by osmosis. And so this is the general model by which all of these important components, various electrolytes, glucose, vitamins, and the water itself is retained within our bodies. So this reabsorption is taking place in the proximal tubule. The next process we'll mention is secretion. So it's kind of like reabsorption only in reverse. This is where if we have excess drugs, vitamins, and protons, right, we're regulating pH, these can be secreted from the vasorecta directly into the tubule. So it's going to occur in both the proximal and the distal tubule, but most of this process occurs in the distal tubule. The final process that we want to discuss here is how can we produce urine that is so concentrated. So the simple process of concentration. This occurs primarily in the collecting duct. And recall the collecting duct is this structure located toward the middle here, which collects all of the urine produced from the thousands of nephrons located throughout our kidneys. And also recall that in humans, we can produce urine that's about four times more concentrated than the blood that's filtered. But other animals, such as the kangaroo rat, can produce urine that's even more highly concentrated. And of course, in an attempt to conserve as much water as possible within their bodies. So how does this all take place? How can we concentrate the waste products found in roughly 180 liters of blood, because that's how much is filtered each day, into one to two liters of urine? Well, first of all, let's set this up by saying that there is a, a concentration gradient of solutes. As we look from the cortex and go deeper and deeper into the medulla. So what kind of solutes are we talking about here involved in this concentration gradient? Well, we have salt released from the loop of Henle. And we also have some urea released from the collecting duct. And we'll see how this, how this works in just, a, in just a moment. Also... I want to point out, if we if we look toward the, the right of this image here, I just want to point out that the descending limb of the loop of Henle is permeable to water, but not to salt. The ascending limb is permeable to salt, sodium chloride, but not to water. So keep that in mind as we discuss what happens as filtrate makes its way through the loop of Henle. So think about this. The filtrate that's initially produced in the renal, renal corpuscle has about the same concentration of solutes as blood. So let's say about 300 milliosmoles. As that filtrate makes its way down the descending limb, again, it's encountering the surrounding tissue, which has a higher and higher concentration of solutes 
indicated by the slightly darker coloration as you go from top to bottom. So what happens, again, this descending limb is permeable to water. So which way is water going to move by osmosis? Well, it will move out of the descending limb. As a result, the filtrate will become more and more concentrated as it makes its way down. We reach the bottom of the loop of Henle, and then we go back up the ascending limb. Recall that this region is permeable to sodium chloride, but not to water. So what happens, salt exits the ascending limb. As a result, the filtrate becomes more dilute as it makes its way up the ascending limb. And unfortunately, this image does not show the collecting duct, but imagine as this urine makes its way into the collecting duct and it moves through the collecting duct, Again, what's going to happen? Well, let's look at this sketch here. Again, there's our, there's our renal corpuscle, descending limb, ascending limb. So here's our collecting duct. Again, cortex toward the top, medulla toward the bottom. Don't forget about the concentration gradient of solutes uh, from cortex to medulla. So as filtrate is making its way through the collecting duct, again, it's going to lose water by osmosis. So just like we saw in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, as filtrate makes its way through the collecting duct, Again, it becomes more concentrated until finally it exits the kidney as urine. So what are uh, some of the mechanisms that regulate the amount and concentration of urine that our bodies produce? Well, there are lots of, lots of things involved here, but we're just going to mention just one example here at this point, namely antidiuretic hormone. So what we see in our image here is, is a nephron, and here's our collecting duct toward the right, antidiuretic hormone. Essentially what this hormone does is causes the collecting duct to be more permeable to water. How does it do that? Well, it triggers production of these, these proteins here, referred to as aquaporins. So aquaporins, these are proteins that can be inserted into membranes, and they essentially uh, cause that structure to be more permeable to water. We find aquaporins not just in nephrons, but in, in other structures as well. But if you think about this, if the collecting duct becomes more permeable to water, that means more water will exit the filtrate as it makes its way through the collecting duct. So as a result, that'll tend to cause a formation of a smaller volume and a higher concentration of urine that's ultimately produced. So again, ADH is just simply one, one factor that regulates the concentration and amount of urine that our bodies produce. So 